Hi to everyone and welcome to this Amatech Land webinar. Okay, right now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, James Cross. James is Middle East Regional Sales Manager at Amatech Land, where he supports customers in reaching the highest standards of process safety, process control, and product quality across a variety of industries with a range of monitors and analyzers for infrared non-contact temperature measurement, combustion efficiency, and environmental pollutant emissions. He previously worked for a manufacturer of sensor and control solutions for heat treatment furnaces. So James, welcome to today's event. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to you to get us started. So James, go right ahead. Welcome to the Amatech LAN presentation on the art and science of steam reformer tube wall temperature measurement. I'm James Cross, the regional sales manager for the middle. The three questions we're looking at for this presentation are how do we measure tube wall temperatures? What are the challenges with those measurements? And how do we overcome those challenges to optimize our reformers? So we're talking about steam methane reforming and in particular the uh, primary syngas reformer. So the primary syngas reformer is heating a um, significant number of tubes containing a uh, catalyst. So when steaming natural gas are passed through the tubes over the catalyst, this catalytic reaction produce, produces our synthetic gas made up of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. That syngas is then used to produce our desired product for whichever industry uh, the process is designed for. So the temperature of those catalyst tubes is highly critical and that's what we're focusing on. There's two main methods for measuring these tube temperatures, contact and non-contact. When we talk about contact, uh, method. We're really talking about thermocouples and thermocouples um, are relatively reliable technology um, used frequently in uh, many industries but the challenges with thermocouples come down to the uh, calibration drift of the thermocouple itself, the cables in between the thermocouple and the instrument and the analog inputs of the instrument itself. Breakage in a primary syngas reformer is particularly challenging because um, it's difficult to replace um, those, um, those thermocouples once they've broken. And really, we're not looking at the true surface temperature, even though we call it contact technology. That thermocouple is sitting on the outside of the tube and uh, may be subject to errors due to the welded mass that the thermocouple is uh, fixed to. Infrared radiation parametry is what Amatec land specialises in and there's also challenges with this technology but we have highly accurate and repeatable uh, measurements. The measuring device itself is in the cooler ambient environment sitting outside the reformer and we can use this technology to measure multiple points as opposed to a contact method which is sitting in a single location. However, the measurement is dependent on operator training and having a good understanding of the emissivity and other effects. And we're going to talk about some of those now. Quick background into infrared polarimetry. So we're talking about the heat which is radiated from objects. Each object above zero Kelvin contains a certain amount of heat and that heat is emitted um, through infrared radiation. So this is the heat we feel from the sun as opposed to the heat we touch um, when we touch a surface. Um, we're operating in the electromagnetic spectrum. So radiation uh, parameters uh, respond to wavelengths within um, this, this specific portion of the, of the spectrum. And our thermometers are generally operational between 0 0.5 and 15 microns. You can see the visible spectrum uh, within the infrared uh, spectrum which uh, is, is why our eye can detect uh, steel, for example, heating up by the change in its color. And the chart here shows the energy emitted from an object as it heats up. So you can see, generally speaking, as an object heats up, its energy is emitted in lower wavelengths, which is why we have a full range of parameters uh, for different temperatures. So the first significant challenge is emissivity. So emissivity is defined as the ratio of the emitted radiation of a real object 
to the emitted radiation of a black body. So a black body is a, a theoretical object which emits all of its infrared energy. Therefore, it has one emissivity. In reality, objects reflect some of its infrared energy. So we compensate for that loss with a correction factor we know as the emissivity factor. So essentially what we're saying is each object that we measure is reflecting internally some of that energy. So we're only seeing a portion of that energy. And the iron in this slide shows what happens if you don't have effective correction. You see a mirrored surface and a coated surface of that iron. The mirrored surface is obviously the same temperature as the coated surface, but without an emissivity correction, the infrared pyrometer thinks these are completely different temperatures because of the variance in reflectivity. So emissivity is one minus reflectivity. This is a challenge in steam reformers because we're measuring tubes which have sometimes an unknown emissivity. And our emissivity changes on material, surface, the temperature of the, of the object and the angle at which we measure it. The second challenge is the site path. So at some of these wavelengths, the thermal en energy emitted from our tube walls, or any steel or metal or any surface, is absorbed by CO2 and H2O. And you can see in this example atmosphere, the transmittance or absorption at various wavelengths. So we need to ensure that we're operating, that our pyrometer is operating in what we call an absorption window. And if we do that, then none of the energy uh, being emitted from the tube wall is being absorbed by H2O or CO2. Therefore, we have good transmittance and we don't have to worry about any errors caused by the atmosphere in between the tube wall and the pyrometer. The third challenge is background effects. So the background refractory in a, in a reformer is often, very commonly, higher than the tube wall temperatures. And that's down to the design of the reformer. The tubes are being heated by the radiation from the refractory. So what our pyrometer sees is the incident radiation from the refractory and the radiation emitted from the tube. Therefore, we need to ensure that our reading, our final reading, corrects for the additional thermal energy from the background. And we use the equation shown. So we always need to take background temperature measurements to ensure that we're not reading too high, i.e. our infrared pyrometer is not reading the combination of background temperature and tube temperature. And if you remember the slide about emissivity, the incident radiation effect will be higher with a more reflective surface. That's why we need to correct for uh, the emissivity and for the background effect. So how do we come, overcome these challenges? The first is through portable pyrometry. So this is a very common method used in the uh, syngas industry. These are low cost, easy to calibrate in a, in a black body furnace and it can take a measurement easily of all tubes through peepholes. But it does require an emissivity offset, requires a clear sight path, and it requires background compensation. The Gold Cup pyrometer is a kind of um, mythical device in the Syngas um, market. We do supply uh, many of these to both end users and service companies. It's a higher cost than a portable pyrometer, it's a three meter long tube, so you can't cover tubes more than three meters away from our peephole. It's around 20 to 25 kilograms wet. So when the cooling water is in the device, it's pretty impractical to move around. But what it does is overcome our emissivity um, uncertainty, our sight path uncertainty and our background radiation uncertainty. Because the tube is held against the surface, the emissivity um, is, not a, um, an, uh, is not a concern because this gold hemisphere that you can see in the images in the top right hand side of the slide creates what we call an enhancement effect whereby the emissivity is bounced through this um, gold, uh, gold cup to the point that we get a, a black body condition or close to a black body condition and then the fiber optic cable takes that um, 
uh, infrared energy to the pyrometer to give us a reading independent of emissivity. So we can use that in combination with the knowledge that the site path is not an issue because there is no site path. We're holding this gold cup against the tube surface. And also background radiation is not an effect because we're shielding the tube for the short time that we're taking the measurement from the background radiation. So our reading from this gold cup pyrometer is independent of the uncertainties, which creates some uncertainty in the uh, portable pyrometer. So we take a portable measurement at the same point that we take a gold cup measurement from to create a reference value. Then the portable instrument can be used across the entire uh, reformer in the knowledge that we have a, a reference value. And there's a, there's a short explanation of how that works. Generally, if you look at the chart on the bottom right hand side, we find that a gold cup will read fairly significantly lower than any portable or uh, fixed devices um, on a reformer. That's generally because the industry standards are conservative and nobody wants to overheat their reformer. So what we find is that uh, reformers are generally uh, heated very cautiously to ensure that tube temperatures are not too high. So it's good in a sense that we're being cautious, but what it does mean is that we could potentially heat these reformers to a slightly higher temperature uh, in the knowledge that that's going to give us uh, a greater product yield. The third method is thermal imaging technology. So this is an example of our shortwave uh, boroscope, the NIRB3XR. And with the cooling water and purge air installed, we can have this permanently installed in a reformer. So the purge air ensures that no hot gases are in permanent contact with the lens. The cooling water ensures that we keep all the electronics below 45 to 50 degrees C. We have a 90 degree um, viewing angle, which means that when we put the lens to the edge of the refractory, you can see all, if not many tubes in a single aisle uh, without having to move that. So it's a fixed camera. And if we install multiple cameras, we can generally get up to 90 to 95% coverage of all tubes in a reformer. So that's giving you a pretty good um, idea of the comprehensive um, uh, temperatures inside the reformer. We also have hazardous area certification, um, ATEX and IACEX approval um, for use in zone two gas atmospheres. So these are some examples of how um, the imaging device sees the reformer. So you can see by taking a scan uh, or a manual scan on the software across the tubes, we can measure the peak tube temperatures. And by looking vertically up and down the tubes, we can see the variation uh, from the bottom of the furnace to the top of the uh, furnace. So in this example, we'd need multiple cameras potentially to see, um, to see the entire tube length. From a troubleshooting perspective, we can see things like cold spots caused by refractory damage, where the reformer is going to be pulling in cold air, causing issues with uh, energy efficiency and potentially uh, significantly uh, damaging tubes. We can see hot spots and we can see the actual temperature of those hot spots to see if the hot spots themselves are getting near to the uh, design limit of the tube. We can see what looks like surface, surface scaling or carbon formation on the tube. And we can see where we have flame impingement, which is causing significant overheating of local um, tubes, which is potentially getting us near to that design limit. When you have flame impingement, generally, you're significantly overheating one section of tubes and underheating another section of tubes. So you've got an efficiency problem and a potential safety and maintenance problem. We can also look at these hot bands um, and we can see if this is a real concern or if this is just a um, slight overheating uh, issue. So we have to balance the tube lifetime with the capacity of the plant. And most people um, in the industry understand uh, the significance of that balance. So with a 2% or with a 20 degree uh, C, uh, deviation from the design tube wall temperature, we can lose around 2% of production. With a 20 de degree C overheat, we can reduce the lifetime of the tubes by up to 50%. So 
So we have to find the window in which we operate um, is, is balancing these two concerns. So generally speaking, we want more accurate tube measurements, want more certainty of the data. And we want to increase the uniformity of the furnace and homogeneity uh, of the tubes. That means we can safely increase the temperature to increase our capacity. From an asset protection side of things, we're taking these measurements to help identify tube failures, and we've got some uh, tube failure modes uh, listed there. We can help indirectly determine the catalyst performance through the uh, tube measurements. We can look at carbon formation, and we can look at overfiring and heat flux calculations. Interior furnace tube measurements can help with balancing the burner controls. We can help with flame impingement, and we can look at the heat input. And we can also look at heat, heat trimming whilst ensuring the uh, balance of the reformer is maintained. From a tube failure perspective, we can generally uh, see problems with creep rupture or weld cracking before they become significantly um, hazardous. So overheating generally is caused by poor temperature control, flame impingement, poor burner alignment, thermal cycling of the tubes. And next commonly, high thermal gradients across the tubes, thermal shock, stress corrosion cracking, and dissimilar well cracking. So all tubes will eventually suffer from creep. So creep is the gradual continuous increase in the tube diameter caused by high temperature stress. And eventually, uh, creep will produce creep rupture. Um, and you can see an example there from uh, ammoniaknowhow.com. Weld failure is something we can also monitor. So welds of different metallurgies are the weakest point of the tube. So they're likely to fail before the tube material itself. So by monitoring these areas specifically, we can see what the temperatures of these welds are to see if they're going near their design limits. And metallurgical innovation in the tube materials themselves puts even higher stresses on these. So we need to closely monitor these areas. And then other benefits, we can centralise the monitoring and control of multiple reformers by integrating this data into a control system and exporting the data on a server. We can look at multiple reformers across the world from a single control room. We can monitor uh, two ball temperatures 24-7 and then we can give alarms uh, based on uh, changes and based on patterns to warn of increased temperatures and increased temperature rates. Uh, we can give re remote support in real time versus asking an operator to go out with a portable instrument. We can balance the reformer to save money in energy and um, tube failures. And then we can build spreadsheets or automate reports to give weekly, monthly tube wall uh, averages, minimums, max temperatures. And during startup and shutdown, we can ensure that uh, there's no potential issues with overheating the tubes or heating the tubes too quickly. And then we've got enhanced operator safety due to the fact that these um, uh, operator checks are not required as often on the reformer, given that we have continuous data. You can uh, go to the Amatecland website to see some press releases and case studies um, of how this technology is being used by the industry. And in conclusion, measuring the temperature is easy but measuring the temperatures accurately and reliable is our challenge. So by using the three non-contact temperature methods we referred to, we can develop a detailed understanding of these surface temperatures and the changes over time. And then by doing that, we can hopefully sleep better at night. We can extend our tube lifetime, maximize the process efficiency, improve the maintenance practices and potentially increase plant capacity. Okay, James, thanks so much for a great presentation. We're gonna wrap things up right there. Take care and have yourselves a great rest of your day.